back to another edition of 705 Sports with Jacob and Dan. So yes. we have a Jay and Dan situation. TSN, don't sue. It's okay. <laughs> but we have a, I don't think they can sue because they aren't Jay and Dan anymore anyway. True. And we did talk about that on this show. And you know what? We will eventually go through some of our biggest topics of the year. Because I would like to state quick, this is our 50th episode of uh, between the segments we started with on the news to this now so this is our 50th show we're a half a century old we are oh well, we're half getting old uh, what, what do they say uh, ahead by a century <laughs> exactly again don't sue us but let's start off with our poll question for today did the vegas golden knights do mark andre fleury dirty now let's get into the mark andre fleury situation apparently he learned from Twitter that he was headed to Chicago and now he's thinking about that's just gonna be it. I I don't necessarily blame him that's just gonna be it because let's be honest Chicago's not competitive. Vegas, I know you're gonna argue with me on that. They're not, they aren't they're Boston, no they're not Vegas, they're not a couple other teams that you can think of off the top of your head mm -hmm. that are to understand, I want to say Montreal, they're not even Montreal. Or the Islanders. Or the so. Islanders or teams that are that are right there on the mm -hmm. cusp. They are B teams. But you have to look at it though. Does Marc Andre Fleury turn that team from a B team into an A team? Let's and be like, honest, he's past his prime. The Vesna goalie from last year though. Like Marc Andre Fleury put up outstanding numbers. Like you cannot go wrong. But the real issue that really bothered me with the whole Marc Andre Fleury situation is that they didn't tell him he was being traded according to his agent, Alan, Alan Walsh. They said they found out via social media. Now here's where it gets interesting. The Vegas Golden Knights are saying that they told him a couple weeks ago that he might be traded so he should have known, according to the Vegas Golden Knights. I but personally feel here, you built the team around Flurry from the expansion draft. The owner promised Flurry he would retire a Golden Knight if he wanted to. He wins you the Vesna candidacy. He's taken you to the conference finals almost every year in the Stanley Cup finals twice. What more do you want from this guy? And I get it's a cap world and fair enough, but at least have the decency to give him a heads up. Understand in a cap world though, he's going from Las Vegas where he was making and I forget exactly the number, and he's headed to Illinois where he's going to make less because of the taxes. True. There's, there's a, there's an argument to be made too that the cap world the way it is at 89 whatever or 86 whatever it is. 81.25. Okay, 81.2 point. 81.25 in Canada, Ontario isn't the same as 81.25 in Florida. No. Isn't the same. So should there be, and we're getting a little off topic here, but should there be a, a way to Okay, so Canada's cap is actually 121 to make up for that tax difference and make it different for each state. That would be interesting. Level the playing field. It would, would level the playing field because you do get players who don't want to come to a market like Toronto because of the high taxes. Or even now, we hear a guy like Zach Bogosian who said he left Toronto because of the COVID restrictions in Ontario. As we all know, Ontario had the hardest COVID restrictions. Bogosian said he didn't want to put up with that. So he went over to the Tampa Bay Lightning. But that is an interesting point. Do you do things like that to even out your salary cap? You already have the injury reserve issue. So I think the salary cap needs to be worked out, but we even with the issues on the salary cap, we still had a very busy free agency in day one. It, it was crazy. Some of it was known. Mm -hmm. Some of it, like you knew that uh, Florida's goalie was headed to Seattle. Yes. That was pretty much spelled out last week. But I didn't expect- In, in the NBA, that's draft. called tampering, but- <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but in the NHL, no one seems to really care. Doesn't seem to care. So you knew that was happening. You'd heard Dougie Hamilton was probably headed there to town. But nine million a year for a defenseman that constantly is taking penalties. I mean, I would have loved to see Toronto get him if he was in that six to seven. But you got to look at it right now, and the Leafs might have this problem of trying to re-sign Morgan Riley now. You have Dougie Hamilton who got nine, Seth Jones who got 9.5 they really raised the market but we did have a very busy free agency with 161 signings over 280 million dollars in cap space was in salary was used this year which is very very impressive and somebody told me five of the teams in the process yesterday went over that 10 percent limit that they're allowed to have um and that's problematic come 
season opener if they're not or it's a, it's it's a training camp isn't it yes training by camp. training camp if they don't cut that back down so you know there's trades coming oh there are definitely trades coming you've already seen teams being very busy but some moves that i want to highlight which i also want to say some of the ones that i called which was blake coleman going to the calgary flames i called that one blake coleman is a fantastic two-way forward at that four and a half million four point nine million a year over six years i actually think that's a very cap friendly contract also like to state that he's making less than zach hyman and the guys won multiple stanley cups montreal made a nice pickup by picking up david savard i think he's someone who i thought there maybe would have either went for savard or hamilton however savard's contract at 3.5 million a year you really can't go wrong with that contract and there montreal. you go with that savard getting 3.5 does he balance out some of those other nines that so you're sure. looking at morgan riley at because let's be honest riley still has work mm -hmm. to do he's he isn't a hamilton Okay, yeah, yes we're going to so argue no, to an extent, yes. Hamilton takes a lot more penalties than Morgan Riley. He turns the puck over a lot more than Morgan Riley. Yes, he has a physical upside that that Morgan Riley doesn't have, but there's other areas where I would say Morgan Riley excels over Dougie Hamilton. Speed. And speed. And puck handling for that which matter. Which this is now a game of speed. But we, you just made the argument yesterday that it's not. Because when, when you look at the teams that made it the furthest, you're still looking at the ones that hit and the ones that can take a hit. But at the same time, they weren't... With Tampa Bay Lightning, I cannot call them a slow team. No. Although, and let's be not honest... Not Montreal know, either, for that matter. Not Montreal, and even the Islanders. They're four lines that they can roll. And I think a thing that I saw in this so far in the first day, at least, is that we're seeing teams that are more going for depth versus star power. You notice it's not the super superstars that are going it's more of these depth players like a blake colmo or dougie hamilton who's a depth defenseman like it's it's been a bit of a surprise this year if you want to go see those depth defensemen in toronto though and you go to a leafs game ticket prices are crazy and for the jays and now, now the jays have seemed to go down that road we're catching some conflicting reports but a uh, fifth level for the home opener tomorrow was 213 per ticket so that's home opener, first time 640 days they've been in Toronto. Uh, call it price gouge by the Jays or whatever you want. We're hearing that somebody got uh, $45 for nine rows back uh, in a couple of weeks here from home plate. Mm -hmm. That's a little more reasonable. reasonable. I could go to a Dodgers game playing the ha Astros in California. I could fly for the 215 <laughs> and everything else with my family. I wanted to spend $1,000 mm -hmm. or even worse, you were looking at six something for down on the main level. For, for $1,200, I could take two of my, me and my friend, fly to California, watch a Dodgers game from not bad seats, turn on, come back around and be here. And come back just looking for Argos tickets. Argos tickets are what, 34 to be Argos inside? tickets, no, we're looking for the season, for their home opener, we're looking at $23 a ticket for an Argos ticket. And two, especially the Argos versus the Tiger Cats for home opener, that is gonna be a fantastic home opener. I do, am, I am wondering, however, because the Jays here may be breaking the law a little bit here in Ontario. So Doug Ford made a law during this pandemic pandemic about price gouging, saying you can only raise your prices so much for pre-pandemic. Now this isn't a necessity item, so I don't know where that would lay in, but this is something that I think maybe the Jays need to be careful of. Because I, I think, think if somebody filed with it, filed a complaint and said, look, this is, this, is wrong. this is gouging, this is because they've been gone, they're taking advantage of the situation, they could be, the competition act might look at them. And the point perspective last But year, then again, it's Rogers and it's the Ford true. government and you're probably not And they're buddy buddy. Happen. But the point perspective last year, a Jays ticket for a season opener was about thirty-five to forty dollars for cheap seats. Yep. Where now it's two hundred and thirteen. So that is a very, very, very did I say very? Very big difference. But we already gotta start to get to a commercial break. So stay with us here. And the big thing is now, as we know, the CFL season is starting next week. That's right. The Canadian Football League is back. So we are going to break down the Canadian Football League teams, see where they're standing, because you know what? We haven't seen them in two years. So stay right here. You stay there, too. We'll be back Unless in three downs. Fire, then you can go. Yes. We'll, but be we'll be back in three downs. We'll be right back in three downs right after this break.
705 Sports. Supported by James Seaton Mortgage Specialist. Your new home doesn't come with mortgage advice. I do. Call James Seaton Mortgage Specialist, RBC, 705-975-1519. And welcome back. Um, that was probably a little longer than three downs for our <laughs> segment because that's what, the one thing we like about CFL is just how three fast and how quick it can be. And not a lot of ground game because you have to get those 10 yards quickly. And the team that did it best last time was Winnipeg. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Now and they're looking eh. Now, I still say they have a chance to repeat here. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers are a team that last year, to remind everyone, won the Great Cup after the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Call out, I know you're watching. They <laughs> joke again. So, Argos fan here. So again, but with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, they had a decent season, and then the playoffs, they started to light it up. Zach Kalaros came back. He's healthy for this year. For all you who don't know, Zach Kalaros is a phenomenal veteran quarterback. In the Grey Cup Final, wasn't his strongest game, but they relied on the running game a lot in that Grey Cup Finals. But in the Grey Cup Final, Kalaros went 17 for 23 with 170 yards, averaging 7.4 yards per play. So he is, as you might remember, former Toronto Argo back in the Ricky Ray days. I had to take half a seat further because I'm also a Ticats fan and I can't be associated. <laughs> no, anyway. <laughs> yes, I agree with that. But we're also looking at stats that are going on almost two years old. It's good. Without, be... without a league, <laughs> without a play, without these players, some of these players being two years older, without having any comp competition. Let's be honest, our, our, our rundown here is great. But we just don't know. It's going to be a wild <laughs> card, realistically. But another... Uh, how training camp go? Literally. Nobody could see anything, you know? But another key player for the Blue Bombers, as you mentioned right off the hop, is the running game isn't used as much in the Canadian Football League. However, Andrew Harris is a phenomenal running back. Last year, out of 225 rushes, 1,380 yards, four touchdowns, and here's the big number here, averaging 6.13 yards per play. Which lets you use him in the CFL. And, you, and what's so great about that is when you're using your running back more, it's giving your quarterback some more room. You see it a lot of times in the NFL and it gives you that play action option. That's where the Blue Bombers excel because they do fast. have that. But Calaris isn't fast. He's not the quickest of, he's not the fleetest of foot is what they would say. The he, fleetest of foot. He, 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 he doesn't seem to have the, the, the speed to, to take advantage of no. opening up those gaps that a running black might bring. Again, possibly going to be okay, but you have a running back at you six, which is good. You mm. get six. You need to get four out of a running back in the CFL. Let's be Absolutely. honest. Absolutely. Per you get anything less than four, you're throwing for six or seven on second down, or vice versa. It, you're just not going to have a running game. You which is why contract. teams like Hamilton build around the air, air, the Air Force. A hundred percent. Now the Hamilton Tiger Cats did. I would call them the Toronto Maple Leafs of the CFL. And I'm sorry. I know you're a Tiger Cats fan. I was raised properly. I'm, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But the Tiger Cats have this issue where, again, last season in 2019, they went 15 and 3. They didn't lose a single game at home. This team was phenomenal. They ripped through the playoffs until you get to the Grey Cup and the team just chokes. But if they're going to have some success again this year, which I imagine Hamilton is going to be another, they're the top dogs of the East. I'm expecting them to be, the, I guess, the top cats of the East. And I'm expecting it again with their two quarterbacks. So Marcelo last year went 125 for 175 with 1575 yards and nine touchdowns. Well, Evans went 298 for 413, 3,754 yards and 21 touchdowns. So what does that tell you? I know what it's telling me. He throw the ball. They like to throw the ball. <laughs> That's what I said about airports. Is the way they've been. They used to be the Hamilton pound and ground and drive you into the dirt, and, and that was the way they played football. Some evolution has happened there over the last six, seven, eight years, and now we throw the ball. We throw the ball, and we throw it well. And I'll and say we throw it well against teams like boats that sink and <laughs> can't keep up with our wide receivers. So. 
Let, yeah, it might be rude, but it's also true. You don't have a secondary, so we're going to do it again this year. <laughs> and what, when you talk about a wide receiver, another guy you're going to watch is Brandon Banks. This guy is nothing but money. He is such a good wide receiver. Last He's a one and done. With a 120, 112 receptions, 1,550 yards, and 13 touchdowns. And they do a great job because, too, their quarterbacks have speed, so you have to have someone being a quarterback spy but then at the same time they also have that deep arm where they can just bomb it so they have that ability where other teams don't what i say about one and done is he's got one more year in the cfl and he's gone unfortunately he's going so this is his year to try this to win. is his year, this is well this is his year to maybe spend six weeks here and then jet to the states possibly like, that that's the other problem cfl frequently has their players that do really well in the first four or five or six weeks get options and opportunities and most CFL teams understand that if they're going to get a shot at the NFL, they're going to take it. They're gone. So Banks lights it up again. He may not even be in the CFL by the end of the year. I mean, the Tiger Cats are hoping he will be. No, because I think is, everybody's hoping he will he be. Is Otherwise, they're in trouble. big part of this Tiger Cats team. The Tiger Cats, to me, are still a bit of a wild card as much as I'm, I would think they're going to have another good season. They're projected to be one of the better teams in the East again. But with their two young quarterbacks who haven't played in a while, the same though Carlisle's being a veteran quarterback hasn't played in a while, do you lose that touch? So I do think Hamilton, though, is going to have another strong year. The East is a bit tougher this year, and we're going to get further down into why. But I think Hamilton, again, has a chance to go to the Grey Cup Finals. Now let's move to another team in the East, which is the Ottawa Red Blacks. So the Ottawa Red Blacks, they're a team that... I would say they're one of the biggest wild cards in the CFL because they fixed I their issue. They did fix some of their issues. Well, they fixed their biggest issue. They fixed their quarterback. True, with this with this Dominic Davis, who he had a rough year last year, but he's been playing with in other catchy. leagues and he's starting to look a lot better. And this guy does have a lot of upside. He has a very strong arm. He can use his speed to get out of the pocket, which I think maybe sometimes uses a bit too much. But I do actually expect Ottawa have, to have a better year than last year. Have last you seen year Ottawa's offensive line? He needs to get out of the pocket. True. <laughs> very, very <laughs> he true. He needs they to be don't fleet of foot well. and get out of the pocket. It, they really don't protect it well. And just to correct myself, they are they actually went 3 and 15, yes. not 13 and 15. That'd be a lot of games. So I would say for the Ottawa Red Blacks, I'm expecting to have a bit of a better season. And again, that's why I'm saying the East is going to be a lot more competitive. But now let's move on to the sinking boat. <laughs> to the Toronto Argos, which I think they're going to be the gravy boat because this team looks a lot better this year. They basically... Did they fix their coaching? They did. They got new coaching. They went and revamped the front office for new guys for Pinball Clemens to work with. And they've also picked up some new players. They picked up two wide receivers from the Calgary Stampeders, which Eric Rogers will be the first wide receiver I want to talk about. In 17 games in 2019, he caught 85 passes, 1,080 yards, and 10 touchdowns. He was named the West Division All-Star for the second time in his career and had three games over 100 yards receiving. So what does this do for Toronto? This gives them that ability that Hamilton has and Winnipeg has with their running game to a point and their receiving game. Did they you fix can the stretch secondary? the field. Did they fix the secondary? Somewhat. They did add a new center yes. who's making a difference, at least from their offensive line. Their secondary, I don't know too much about their secondary as of right now. They didn't do uh, a lot. They didn't do a lot with that, but they did a lot for the offense. They also added another receiver, Briskin. Briskin's another solid player from Calgary who in 18 games last year caught a career-high 35 passes for 567 yards and three touchdowns. What that tells me is he's a very efficient wide receiver. So I think for Toronto, they did make some improvements. And last but definitely not least, they brought back Bethel Thompson. I like this quarterback. I honestly feel with a better receiving core that he has this year, I do feel he will be better. Played 18 games last year. Oh, oh two years ago now. Man, I miss the CFL. Thank you for coming back. They He completed 335 for 493, over 4,000 yards, and threw for 26 touchdowns and 13 receptions. He led the CFL in touchdown passes, which is awesome. But you know what? We got to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to wrap up the rest of the CFL. And then we're going to also get into the Toronto Maple Leafs and what they need to do to fill Zach Hyman's void. We'll be right back. Together, we can reduce the spread of COVID-19. 
Went grocery shopping? Fill the car with gas? Picked up a prescription? Wash your hands often to help reduce the spread of germs. It can save lives. A message from the Government of Canada. And we're back in shorter time than it would take either Jacob or I to run the 40 yards. <laughs> so, who are we looking at next? I think we said we have Montreal to look at here. Yeah, Quick, next. And then off to Calgary in the West Division. Exactly. So, next we are going to have the Montreal Alouettes. Last year, they went 10 and 8. I'm expecting them to be another playoff team. They went to the conference finals last year, which was really not expected from that team. But I do think they are going to be another good team again this year. I don't know if you know much about Vernon Adam Jr., their quarterback, but he is actually a pretty darn good quarterback. He's fleet of foot. <laughs> he uses his speed to make smart throws. Yeah, and you know, and that's and that's what I like with him. And he needs to stop trying to use the deep ball as much because he gets on the run and then he tries to use that deep ball to get across, him in trouble. Across the field. Exactly, which will then get him into some trouble. But he, remember, he is that much older now. He did throw for almost 4,000 yards last year, 24 touchdowns. He was 283 for 431. So I'm expecting him to have another And he can still throw game. it deeper than your Uruguay guy. Zing. <laughs> Aww. We get to go west now, and this is something I will always say about Western Canada football. Defense wins championships. They play much harder. They play, they aren't as fast, but they are very ground, like they, they grind you into the ground. And we're watching here as, as we see Calgary's lost a couple of wide receivers. Calgary's lost a few of their prime players. Yes. But they didn't lose their defense. They didn't lose their, their defensive line. A lot of them are coming back. Defense stops all these fast offenses from the East. Very, very true. And they still do have Bo Levi Mitchell, who is like one of the better quarterbacks in the CFL. Mitchell last year started in 11 regular season games, going 274 for 215 at a 66% completion rate. I want you to think about that, 66% completion rate. And he can throw it downfield too. He can throw it. And he feels mean to me today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get to tell you while you were ramping up your Argo is that your quarterback can't throw it past 25 yards. It just doesn't work. That, that, that calculation on the on, on the targeting doesn't seem to multiply in his head to get it out there. And you agreed with me. I do. Offset. He, I do he doesn't do a long ball. It just You can have wide receivers that run the 40 all you want, but if you can't hit them... It is going, that could be a huge problem for the Argos. The Stampeders don't have that problem no. now with their quarterback, but now because they've lost a couple of their top wide receivers, they could have that problem with their passing game still. Now, mind you, I still expect Calgary to be a good team in the second West. Second in the West. Second in the West. Yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. They're second in the West. So who's first in the West? I want to tell you the Edmonton Elks are going to be first in the West. You think the Edmonton Elks? I, the new name change is kind of an eh with, all, with everybody involved. But you're just looking at consistency. They have consistently been right around that 500 mark. They've made a couple of additions this year. And I think those additions are going to take them to that first to 13-4, 13-5 area. Which might be enough, considering the East should beat up on them a little bit further, to, uh, to get you into that first spot. And you know what, what they do have as well, just like what Calgary has, they also have a very good quarterback in Trevor Harris. Trevor Harris in 13 games, started all 13 of them, had a completion rating of, hold on to your socks, 71.8%. That is like, I hear Kevin's freaking out in production. Like that is a very, very good number. He is a very He gives 110% all the time. He really does. <laughs> and like, he is a very, very strong quarterback where I'm expecting that the, you know what? I don't know if the Elks will be first. I think Calgary and Saskatchewan may have something to say about that to you. Saskatchewan, again, you're hitting me. I, I, I've loved Saskatchewan since I was a kid. If I had to pick a West team, that's the West team. I still think you're going to have some issues with them. Again, mm -hmm. Saskatchewan has the same problem as Toronto. Their, their quarterback can't throw balls down deep. Yes, with Cody, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this name wrong, Cody Farjob, who Fra is... Yeah. I could be pronouncing that name wrong, for job, so for my job, apologies for job, for job, there. Yeah. But you are right, he is a quarterback that sometimes has troubles with hitting that deep ball. He is a strong quarterback, 
and he definitely makes a big impact on his team, but he might not be able to hit that long ball the same way as Harris can or Bo Levi Mitchell. And jumping back to the Stampeders, and we said they lost a lot of their receiving core, they still do have Shaq Evans, and this guy can run the deep ball like no tomorrow. He is a gazelle. He is, he is in last year at 18 games. He led his team with 1,334 yards on 72 receptions with five touchdowns. He also made it to the All-Star game for the Canadian Football League. So the only teams we have to go through left are the BC Lions and yeah, just the BC Lions. Because we kind of quickly touched on the Rough yep. Riders and I will say the Rough Riders are another team that I do expect to be Better. towards the top. They were 13-5 and five last year. Their playoffs were a disappointment, so expect them to try to fix that. Do, do we expect BC to still be in the bottom? I still expect BC to be the end. They, they've gotten better, but the teams around them have gotten better, which puts the BC Lions back in the den. I think so. The bottom the Worst day. team in the West last year. I'm expecting a... Does that turn to seven? Team. Does that does that turn to seven wins instead of five? Uh, maybe. I mean, Michael Ryan's... I mean, Michael Riley, sorry, is a good quarterback. Like, he is a good quarterback, but it, as I have here, they need to protect him better. Last season in the first five games, over 10% of the plays he was sacked. And that is such a huge problem. But you know what? We got to move off from the CFL. Remember, season opener this Thursday. Make sure you're tuning in. And of course, we're going to have another preview for that game as well. But let's get into the NHL. I have way too many papers. Yeah, since we're going to scratch the Jays thing, watch for me next Monday. I'll kind of give somebody <laughs> something on some sort of trade if they do something. I just don't see it. But we're going to have to get to the Leafs here quickly. We've got a couple of minutes left in the show. We're looking at a Hyman situation with Hyman leaving. Th and the Leafs were grateful for all his service to the community mm -hmm. and everything else. It was a wonderful tweet to him that was put out yesterday by the Leafs yes. but it leaves a huge void. And with Felino leaving for Boston, which is kind of a kick in the face, um, where, where do we go from here? Now, I think what I want to talk about today is who I think could replace Zach Hyman. Nick Felino, you know what? The team was good before he got here. I think the team will still be good without him as much as that'll go down as Dubas' second worst trade he's done as a Leaf general manager. The first one was Tyson Berry for Nazem Kadri. Overall, I still think he's been doing a pretty decent job, but I am looking at this. I think we could see Mikheyev going into that role with Hyman. Maybe they recently acquired Michael Bunting, who used to play for the Sioux Greyhounds. But I do think the Leafs are going to have some troubles with that top six. I still think they should pick up Kyle Palmieri, which is a player that I said going into the free agent preview that I felt he would be a good fit. But you are right. Hyman Cut. is a huge hole. Maybe you Cut. see Kerfoot going to the wing. Galchaniak's do, testing the open market, so it's not like I can do, use him to replace him. Do we him. have another Sault Ste. Marie Greyhound former elite guy that might fit the hole here? Because that seems to be what Kyle's doing. He's building his Greyhound, <laughs> Greyhound dream team. I saw that one tweeted out last yeah. night. I went back and looked at some of the, and went, yeah, he kind of is. He's taking the dream team for who he could have had when he was here and putting them on the Leafs. So my, better or worse. <laughs> so I do think Hyman's going to be hard re to replace. I don't think Dubas is done yet. When they were talking to his pre to him in a press conference, they were saying he's now looking into your B list of players. No disrespect to them, but that is like your Kyle Palmieri, since guys like Hoffman are now off the table. Does Robertson fill this hole though? Does homegrown talent, somebody who's been working their butt off in the minors, playing some games? Does he fill? Does he fill that Hyman hole? I think he fills the second line fantastic with Tavares and Nylander. What happens if you put him on the first line? I don't see him doing what Hyman did because he's a smaller guy who isn't good in the corners. He's more of a sniper, which we already have in Matthews. That's why I would say Mikheyev, maybe this Bunting, maybe even Envol. I was going to say Envol was in the corners to the wing. But there's tons of decisions they could make quickly before we go. I do want to quickly talk about the Leafs also picking up Peter Morazic. Not the biggest fan of this move on my end. I feel for $3.8 million, we could have got more of a veteran presence that I think could have made a big difference for this team. But Morazic we have one of the best no goalie coaches in the league, so if anybody can fix him, we can. That is true, and you know what? Morazic <laughs> has always played in a tandem role, and I think for him and Jack Campbell, the That's tandem is going to be fantastic. But you know what, Dan? I know, we gotta go. We gotta go, but... You know what? Thank you so much for joining. And you know what, Dan? I'm thinking maybe later next week we sit down and we collaborate again to do something on the Toronto Blue Jays. Uh, provided they actually do something, which I'm not sold on. But before the next home run is hit, we will not see you again. <laughs> ha have a good night and 
enjoy the show.